So let's summarize some of the key concepts in Unit 2. Unit 2 is about some basic science that underlies semiconductor physics. You know, people were building steam engines long before they understood the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, but it really required an understanding of quantum mechanics and then solid state physics before people could seriously start developing semiconductor technology. Our goal in Unit 2 is to get some familiarity with some of these basic concepts. If you're interested in diving deeper, I would encourage you to take additional courses on these topics, but we'll introduce what these concepts are to you in Unit 2. So just to summarize what we've discussed, uh, we tried to present a very rudimentary uh, introduction to quantum mechanics. Some of you have already seen more than we've discussed here and an understanding of what the Schrodinger wave equation is and how we solve it. Uh, electrons are both particles and waves. There were some important wave concepts having to do with phase velocity, group velocity, wave vector, momentum of a wave, uncertainty relations that we discussed. Quantum confinement used to be one of those textbook examples that you would encounter in your first quantum mechanics course. In semiconductors devices today, we can produce quantum wells, and we can confine electrons, and they become very important practical considerations. Uh, quantum mechanical tunneling, to a large extent, and reflection are also non-classical effects that we need to understand because they can affect semiconducting devices. Now, the energy-momentum relation of a carrier in a semiconductor lattice is something we discussed in Unit 1 we just presented what the answer was. We tried to give a little more understanding of where this comes from in Unit 2. And finally, there is a very important concept called density of states that tells us how many states there are in a range of energies. And we will use this over and over again in the subsequent uh, parts of the course. That was an important concept that we were leading up to in Unit 2. All right, so let's begin. We, there are classical particles that are described by Newton's laws. If we exert a force on a particle, uh, momentum will change, force is dp dt. And we saw how, with using Newton's law, we learned in freshman physics, uh, how to calculate the momentum versus time, velocity versus time, position versus time of a classical particle. Well, an electron in a Semiconductor lattice is a quantum mechanical particle, and things are really much more involved. It turns out in the end, people have learned how to simplify them and make use of these classical concepts. It all begins with an understanding of electrons as quantum mechanical particles described by a wave function that is both space dependent and time dependent. There's a relation between the energy of the particle and the frequency uh, discovered first by Max Planck and the space-dependent part of the wave function is in what can be expressed in terms of the time-independent Schrodinger equation. The way we interpret this wave function is that the wave function psi times its complex conjugate, psi star psi, gives the probability of finding an electron at that location. So remember, if we have a free electron, if we have a free electron, its kinetic energy is one-half mv squared or momentum squared divided by two times the mass. Uh, if we think of momentum as wave vector k, h bar times wave vector k, then we could write the energy versus crystal momentum or wave vector relation for a free particle like this. Quantum mechanically, we start with the Schrodinger equation. When the energy is greater than the, than the uh, potential energy, u0 here, uh, we will find that there are wave solutions, and there is a wave vector, 2 pi over wavelength, uh, which is related to the mass and the energy of the, of the particle. The solutions we discussed are waves with a wave vector k. If we want the full time-dependent solution, we multiply by the time-dependent component, and we write a wave in the complex form in this matter. This describes a wave, uh, a point of constant phase on this wave moves with a velocity we call the phase velocity. Uh, this is a wave that has a wave vector k 
which is 2 pi over its wavelength. It has a momentum, h bar, times wave vector k, and a point of constant phase is moving at a velocity that is frequency divided by wave vector. Okay, these are some important concepts for free particles. An electron exists in a certain location. A wave exists everywhere. How do we describe an electron? We describe an electron by making a wave packet. That is, we take a small number, a small spread of different wave vectors, and we create a wave packet such that the probabilities add up in phase at the location of the particle and out of phase away from the particle, so we localize a particle at a position x naught. You can see it's not precisely located. There is some uncertainty in exactly where this electron is located. And that leads to these important uncertainty relations. Uh, delta, the uncertainty in the momentum and the location uh, is related by this uncertainty relation. There is a similar uncertainty relation relating the uncertainty in energy and, and time. Uh, these are known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, relations. And these are a fundamental difference between quantum mechanical particles and classical particles. Now, a lot of what we're talking about here has to do with properties of waves. Any wave has a dispersion. That is, it has a relation between its frequency omega and its wave vector k. So there is some omega versus k that describes electron waves or electromagnetic waves or whatever kind of waves that we have. It's important to understand something about these waves. As we mentioned just earlier, a point of constant phase on these waves moves at a, at a velocity called the phase velocity. Frequency of the wave divided by the wave vector of the wave. Now, if we have a packet of waves, and we use packets of waves to describe particles quantum mechanically, the packet of waves propagates at the group velocity, at the group of waves with these different wave vectors. And that group velocity is the slope of omega versus k. So phase velocity, group velocity. We're going to primarily be interested in the group velocity to describe the velocity of electrons in crystals. Okay. Okay, so we spent some time discussing solutions to the wave equation. It depends on whether the energy is above, or the energy of the particles above or below the constant potential u. When it's above, we get wave oscillating solutions. Um, when it's below, we get exponentially increasing or decreasing solutions. So, you know, given a potential potential profile and applying the right boundary conditions on the, on the wave equation, we can deduce these solutions. Now, one of the important problems, usually the first problem that one does when learning uh, quantum mechanics is a so-called particle in a box problem. So this is a problem where we have a energy barrier that is confining a particle to be in a small region of width w, and we find we get quantized energy states there. You know, how does this all come about? Well, we solve the wave equation. We know that the solutions are e to the i kx, e to the minus i kx, or superpositions. Uh, the, the simplest superposition to consider here are sines and cosines. We can throw out the cosine solution because the wave function has to go to zero at both ends. Uh, we can force the wave function to go to zero at x equals w by permitting only discrete values of k to uh, occur. Those discrete values of k are related to the energy in the wave equation, so we end up with discrete values of energy. These are the energy levels in the particle in a box. Okay, so takeaways. Confined energies, when we confine electrons, we quantize their energy. The tighter we confine them, the narrower the well, the higher the energies. The lighter the mass, the higher the energies. So those are some qualitative uh, considerations that can allow us to understand what might happen if we have a quantum well in a light effective mass semiconductor like gallium arsenide versus a heavier effective mass material like silicon. Well, we can produce quantum wells with modern semiconductor technology. So we can, with crystal growth techniques, for example, 
we can sandwich a small band gap gallium arsenide layer, 1.4 electron volts or so, between two wider band gap aluminum gallium arsenide semiconductors, 1.7 electron volts or so, and we can confine those electrons to move in this two dimensional plane. These are now two dimensional electrons. They're confined in the z direction, so they'll have confined energies associated with that, but they're also free to move in the xy plane. So, in this case, the solutions to the wave equation will not be plane waves in all three directions. There'll be waves in two directions, the x and the y directions, and there'll be a sine function in the z direction. Okay? And we'll have a set of quantized states associated with that confinement in the z direction. That means there'll be a, a set of associated energies. But the total energy will be the sum of the kinetic of the energy due to that confinement plus the kinetic energy of the electrons moving in the xy plane. Electrons in these energy levels then, uh, they are, are free to move and gain energy in the xy plane. We call these energy, these energy levels are really energy bands. An electron can exist in the first subband or the second subband. So, for example, the conduction band now has been broken up into a set of discrete subbands. Those are the only states that electrons can reside in when we quantum mechanically confine them in this manner. Now, there are other important quantum mechanical effects that you need to be aware of. Uh, one has to do with tunneling. So classically, if an electron impinges on a barrier and it doesn't have enough energy, it bounces back and reflects. It can't get through. Quantum mechanically, there is some probability that the quantum mechanical wave can tunnel through and come out the other side. This is a problem that can be solved by solving the Schrodinger wave equation. And what we find is an expression for the transmission, the probability that the current will come out the other side, given by this expression. So some things to remember to, when you're thinking about the implications for devices is that the thinner the barrier becomes, the higher the transmission. And it depends exponentially on the thickness of the barrier. Um, tunneling also becomes less and less important as the height of the barrier becomes higher. And tunneling also becomes less and less important as the mass of the particle increases. So that can give us some qualitative understanding of what to expect in different kinds of semiconductors with different thicknesses and heights of energy barriers. Now, quantum mechanical particles can also reflect. If this were a classical particle and it had a high enough energy, it could just go over the top of the barrier. If it's a quantum mechanical particle, there is still a probability that it can reflect. So there's a reflection coefficient that we could compute by solving the Schrodinger wave equation. If we want to avoid these reflections, we would have to slowly grade the potential uh, from the low region to the high region. That would be creating an anti-reflection coating for the electrons. Now what about crystals? Crystals are very complicated uh, entities where we have a potential, the crystal potential, that varies on an atomic scale. Uh, we have a, an electron wave that is propagating through this complex potential. Well, one of the triumphs of early quantum mechanics is that we understood that the solutions to the wave equation in a periodic potential, uh, the solutions are a plane wave, e to the i k dot r, modulated by a function with the periodicity of the crystal lattice. That's called the block function. And these are called block waves. So these are the solutions to the Schrodinger equation in a periodic potential. Now, as you might guess, if we plot energy versus wave vector in a material with a periodic potential, the energy versus wave vector plot will be periodic in k-space. Uh, we call k-space or wave vector space reciprocal space because it has the dimensions of one over real space, position space. There is a region within this space over which the period the, where we have a unique solution, and then it repeats itself in every other region. In the simplest one-dimensional case, k would go from plus pi over a to minus pi over a, where a is the lattice spacing. So 
all unique solutions occur here, and we can just repeat this infinitely uh, across the whole space and get the entire relation. This region is called the Brillouin zone, after the scientist who figured this out for wave propagation in periodic media long ago. Now you'll note that there is a region near the origin here where we could approximate E versus K by a parabola. And if we do that, uh, we could introduce something called the effective mass, which is related to the curvature of that parameter. This is where effective mass comes from. And it's valid as long as we stay near a region where E of K is described by a parabola. So we generally draw EK plots for semiconductors like this. We might show the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band throughout an entire Brillouin zone. You know, very simple 1D example here. We can then describe near the minima or maxima E versus K with a parabola related to the effective mass. So effective mass for electrons, effective mass for holes. The effective mass is simply uh, related to one over the curvature of the EK relation. Now there's also a group velocity that describes how electrons, the velocity at which they move in the crystal. And the group velocity you'll remember is given by the slope d omega dk or 1 over h bar de dk. And we can show also that for a parabola, for a parabolic band, the group velocity is simply crystal momentum divided by effective mass. This works out to be h bar k divided by effective mass, just as you would expect for a classical particle, which is very nice. Now, in reality, crystal potentials are very complicated. Uh, 3D lattices are very complicated. There are well-developed techniques for computing energy versus wave vector in complex crystals. For the most part, these uh, E versus K structures are well known. Here's an example of what it looks like for silicon with E versus K plotted along various lines in the crystal lattice. And you can see it looks quite complicated. But electrons will reside near the minima of the conduction band and you can see that if we're close enough to that minima, that looks like a parabola. And holes will reside near the top of the valence band. And as long as we stick near the top of the valence band, we can describe the holes with a parabolic band structure as well. So that will lead to these simplified model band structures that are widely used in semiconductor work. As long as the electrons and holes are near the band edges, we can typically make use of EK relations like this. So for silicon, if you looked carefully at the previous plot, you saw that there are actually two valence bands at K equals zero, a light heavy band and a hole heavy band. Uh, there is a conduction band. It's an indirect back, uh, band gap semiconductor. There's a conduction band that is located out along a 100 direction in the crystal lattice. There are actually six of these because of symmetry. There's another one at 010. There's another one at 001. And then there are three more in the negative uh, corresponding axes directions. So there are six equivalent ones of these uh, conduction band minima. So here are those six conduction band minima. The way we think about this is we can describe the EK relation near the minima of those parabolas uh, in this way. It turns out that the curvature is different in different directions. If we plot this relation, we'll see that this is the equation of an ellipse. So for a constant energy, so if we look at you know, where can an electron be in k-space if it has a constant energy? It can be somewhere on the surface of these ellipses, and there are six of them due to the cubic symmetry of the crystal lattice. So we will frequently refer to ellipsoidal energy bands. This is what we're referring to, an EK relation that looks like this. And there are only two independent effective masses for silicon. There's one along the long axis of the ellipse. That's the longitudinal effective mass that is quite heavy. And then there is one orthogonal to that in the x in the other two directions, which is the transverse effective mass, which is quite a bit lighter. We say that we have a valley degeneracy of six because there are six of these minima in the conduction band. Now, how about gallium arsenide? There is a model band structure for gallium arsenide as well. The valence band looks very similar. 
the conduction man looks similar too, except that the valley at k equals zero is the lowest one now, and it has a very light effective mass, light compared to silicon. This is a direct gap semiconductor. Now, if we look at E, K in a direct gap semiconductor like gallium arsenide, we will find a constant energy surface that looks like this. In this case, the E, K relation is very simple. The effective mass is the same in all three directions. If you look at that for a constant energy, that's the equation for a sphere. So an electron with a constant kinetic energy in gallium arsenide sits somewhere in k-space on this sphere. So we'll refer to these as spherical energy bands. And in gallium arsenide and in many direct gap semiconductors, the effective mass is quite light. Now finally, we were leading up in this lecture, or this unit, to a concept called density of states. So if I have a an EK plot in a semiconductor, we learned that in K space, if I have a finite volume of K space, I will have a finite number of states. And those states are uniformly spaced by 2 pi over the length of this region that I'm counting my states in, L sub x. Okay. Now, for each of those states, there is a corresponding state in energy. Uh, the energy of the state is different for each of those. So we can map those uniformly spaced k states onto a set of non-uniformly spaced energy states. So the states are distributed non-uniformly in energy depending on the particular E of k relation for this semiconductor. So if there's a number of states in a certain region of k space, there's going to be the same number of states in a corresponding region of energy space. And we can do this mapping, and we can determine how the states are distributed in energy. That is going to be something that we're going to make a lot of use of in the next unit. So this density of states, uh, let's assume I have parabolic bands. E is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. I could have bulk 3D electrons, electrons free to move in all three dimensions or I could quantum mechanically confine them so they can only move in one direction, as in a nanowire, or in two directions in a plane, that I, the example that I showed earlier about quantum confinement. In each of those three cases, we will get a different density of states for the electrons. The expressions are given here, and they're relatively easy to work out. If we were to sketch them, we would have plots like this. So in 1D, the lowest energy that can occur is the bottom of the lowest subband. You know, they've been quantum mechanically confined, so we, they, there are no states at the bottom of the conduction band. That first state has been pushed up because of quantum mechanical confinement, and the density of states goes as 1 over the energy minus the bottom of that subband. So it goes to infinity when the electron approaches the bottom of the subband. That's okay, the integrals that we need all turn out to be finite. In two dimensions, we also produce two-dimensional electrons by quantum mechanical confinement. In this case, for parabolic bands, as long as the electron has an energy above the bottom of the subband, it has a constant density of states determined by the effective mass. And then finally, for 3D bulk semiconductors, which is mostly what we are going to be talking about in this course, electrons, uh, there is no quantum confinement, Electron energies can approach the bottom of the conduction band. The density of states is proportional to the square root of the energy above the bottom of the conduction band. So these are kind of important things that you want to keep in the back of your mind when thinking about densities of states in common semiconductors. Well, that's it. There are a lot of really deep and profound concepts here. If you can get comfortable with them, we can make use of them and do an amazing amount in terms of understanding semiconductor physics and devices. So what you should um, go back and uh, review and, and try to refresh yourself are on, on some of these very simple rudiments of quantum mechanics that we discussed, some basic concepts having to do with waves like group velocity, wave vectors, momentum of a wave. You should have an understanding of what quantum confinement is and what it does. You should know what a subband is. Uh, you should know what we mean by quantum mechanical tunneling and reflection. 
And you should understand E of K and what the periodic crystal potential does, uh, what a Brillouin zone is, what constant energy surfaces are, uh, what we mean by parabolic energy bands, what we mean by spherical energy bands. And finally, you should know what a density of states is and what it means, and we will learn how to use the, a density of states when we begin in the next lecture in Unit 3. Thank you.